pray together. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this uh, day that you have been with us. We thank you for your word that you have been sending to us since morning. Thank you for the fellowship we have had together with ourselves. And thank you for your promise that we will see heavens opened. We we'll see angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Thank you, Lord, that you have set us aside as your agent of transformation. Lord, we pray that as we now look at the ministry that can bring effective transformation, please open our understanding. We pray, Lord, that your hand will rest upon us this evening and your spirit will come upon us afresh. And that, Lord, you will release us and give us an unction. Set us, O Lord, in motion, thou, O man of war. Holy Spirit, we ask that you please uh, walk with us and open the word of God to us in the short period we have before we continue the rest of the program today. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. In Jesus Christ's name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord. We are looking at so, the ministry that brings effective transformation. We have been talking about the minister, the minister. But now we need to now look at what is that ministry, what is that work that God has given to us that will create effective transformation. And I'd like us to pick the word of God again as we began to read in the morning. We're going to now pick it, but now we're looking at the effective ministration that brings the transformation to the heart of men. I would like you to please take your Bibles. Let's take our Bibles again. We're going to look at that second Timothy that we started reading. Uh, Second Timothy chapter 2, we're going to pick it up again. You know that uh, our theme text, as in Romans 12, verse 2, which we are yet to talk about. But I trust that God is leading us now to begin to look at what is the ministry that brings effective transformation. Praise the Lord. 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy, no, 2 Timothy first, just to start from where we stopped in the morning, 2 Timothy chapter 2, you remember that we read from verse 15, I want us to read again from verse 15, verse 15, verse 16, Verse 17. Study and be eager and do your utmost to present yourself to God, approved, tested by trial. I'm reading the Amplified Version again. A workman who has no cause to be ashamed, correctly analyzing and accurately dividing rightly handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. But avoid all empty, vain, useless, I do talk, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness. And their teaching will devour. It will eat its way like cancer or spread like gangrene. So it is with Imino and Philetus. I want us to stop at that point uh, as we uh, begin to look at what is the ministry 
that will bring effective transformation. Let me begin by saying, life beget life. Fire begets fire. No man can gather grapefruit from bamboo bush. No man can gather, maybe we should read that passage along with what we need to study here. Go with me to Luke chapter six. Luke chapter six. Luke in chapter six. Uh, thank you very much. Luke 6. And I'd like to pick it from verse 30. Mm, from verse 40. Luke chapter 6. From verse 40. Look at what the word of God says there. Because that's where we're starting. In verse 39 first. And he spoke a parable to them. Luke 6, 39, he spoke a parable to them. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into the ditch? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not perceive the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, brother, let me remove the speck that is in your eye. When you yourself do not see the plank that is in your own eye, hypocrite, first, Remove the plant from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck that is in your brother's eye. For a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bamboo bush. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. Now, this is the Lord Jesus taking his disciples aside, those that he was training to become agents of transformation, those that he was raising, who will take over from him and who will lead the transformation, the move of God, the, the divine visitation that came on the day of Pentecost. This is a very uh, exclusive instruction that he called them aside. He took them to the mountain apart and began to speak to them. Uh, because if we don't understand biblical principle of becoming a minister that can bring transformation, we might be saying too many things. We will be thinking that there are so many things that we need to talk about. But there is really one thing that is needful that God must open our eyes to see. Now, look at Jesus. He was talking to people that he was preparing to become his apostle, people that will provide leadership in the coming days, people upon whom the Holy Ghost is going to be poured and who will become the foundation of the body of Christ that God said I will build. Now let's quickly look at what he said to them before we return to the text that we read in 
second timothy say can the blind lead the blind brothers and sisters what is the answer to that question can the blind lead the blind the trouble is that what it takes to lead the blind is that you have your eyes to see. If a leader accepts to lead, but he himself is blind, look at the result. Then we they noble fall into the deep. A disciple is not above his teacher. A church member can never rise higher than the pastor as far as spirituality will be concerned. Except he is drawing and eating and drinking from somewhere else. You cannot make people what you have never been. A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained when they have followed well, when they have learned very well, when you have taught them very well, the Bible says he will be like his teacher. Let me ask us to read that verse 40 from the Amplified Version that we have been uh, using all along. Let's, let's try to read that verse 40 there. Now, in verse 40, the Bible says, a pupil is not superior to a teacher, but everyone, when he is completely trained, and what does it mean to be trained completely? When he's completely readjusted, when he's restored, when he's set to right and perfected, you will see that all the language they use there, they are the parameters of transformation. When people come under our hand, they come to be readjusted. They come to be recreated. They come to be restored from their deviation. They have come to be set to right so that they can live right. And when they have been perfected in this training, the Bible said, he cannot be superior to a teacher. He will only be like a teacher. So let's note that now, that you can never effect any transformation in the life of the people that are hearing you over and above the transformation that you yourself have experienced. And you cannot make them to become something else or something higher than who you are. So the first effective ministry that can bring transformation is first and foremost your life. So if you hear me now, what will be the ministry that can bring effective, effective transformation? It must be the ministry of life, but not just of life the ministry of your life. It is your life that actually forms the basis of the transformation that people under you can have. Whatever is going on in you, whether people know it or they don't know it, it is the result or what they will collect from your hand. Look at how the word of God is putting it now. Now, before I get to that, 
Jesus was asking his disciples, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice or consider the beam of timber that is in your own eye? Why? See, so the first question is, why? Why? Why will you ever attempt to want to remove the speck in the life of a church member when you have not sat down to consider or to notice the beam, the plank that is in your own eye. So when any, any man is standing up to say something or to try to correct people, in an area where he himself is at fault. The only question they are asking in heaven is why? Why? Why is he doing that? Why is this man on the pulpit for God's sake? Why? Who put him there? How can he be standing to say something that he himself is not? How can he be asking to take away the speck of sawdust in somebody's eye when his own plank, the plank in his eyes, had not been removed. So the first question, if we are going to have a ministry that brings effective transformation to the people, I say it is first and foremost the ministry of your life. I don't just want to say the ministry of life. It is the ministry of your life. It is your life that ministers life. It is your life that compares other people's life to change. Let us, we cannot overemphasize that at all. It is not a big grammar you can speak. It is not how much powerful Bible exposition you will give that matters. What God is first demanding, and that's why he has been focusing on our life, is because it is your life that is first and foremost the essence of your ministry. Even if you don't know how to speak, even if you don't know how to uh, bring a very powerful Bible teaching, but you have a life that is followable. You have a life that compares following. You have a life that compares obedience. There will be transformation. There will be a change. There will be a revival in that congregation by the grace of God. Now, he asked this question very quickly. Or how? Look at verse 42 now. How can you say to your brother, brother, allow me to take out the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the beam that is in your own eye? How, how will you be saying that? In which way will you be doing ministry when you yourself you are incapacitated in that matter? So the first emphasis that Jesus was drawing for the people he was preparing to become the, the agent of transformation is the ministry of their own life. And so you see Jesus was setting the priority. And what is the priority? Look at it. He said, you you pretender, you hypocrite. I love the way that the uh, version put it. You actor. You see, it's a terrible thing to always come to the pulpit as a dramatic. You come to the pulpit to be who you are not. You are just an actor. And you know, for example, I've been a drama 
uh, I used to be in drama for many years before God uh, moved me on. I used to uh, be in drama. And what, what is it that is drama? Drama is a performance of roles that you are not. There's a great difference between the backstage and the stage. Those of us in drama, when we are practicing, when it is time for me to come on stage to perform a particular scene, if it is for me to laugh and make everybody feel nice, I may be, I may be crying at the backstage, oh, but when it is time for me to go to the stage to go and play my role, oh my God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'll be laughing with my two mouths open because it's a drama. And when I come back, I get back to the bad stage. I say, did I do well? Did I do well? They say, oh, you are fine. I'm back to normal. Now, and that is the that is the very terrible challenge of a preacher. It is the very, very terrible hazard of our ministry. What is the hazard? The hazard of constant performance. Imagine that you are coming to church. There may be a challenge at home. This challenge may be something that has really weighed your heart down. And you were actually crying and your eyes were red because there's a problem. But because you are going to officiate, as soon as it is time you step into the pulpit, what do you say? That the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Brethren, let us just stand up and give praise to the Lord our God, the Lord who answers prayer. Oh God, we worship you, we bless you. You are a great God, you are wonderful. There's nothing, nothing beyond you. There's nothing that you cannot do. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You lift up those two hands. You, you laugh, you give that wonderful, that wonderful call to worship. But the truth of the matter is that five minutes before now, you might even really be in trouble and you may have been quarreling with your wife. And sometimes as you are coming, you just, you may even give your wife the white handkerchief and say, you better close, you better wipe your face. Eh? Is your, why are you crying? Your eyes is crying. I see so that everybody can know we have problems. We are going to church. My preachers are great dramatic. Preachers can be a great actor. And I want to tell you why. Something tells you, something tells us that for the sake of the congregation, we need to pretend that we are happy. So that the congregation will not be feeling bad. We need, to, we need to do something. We need to dance so that everybody can dance. We are wrong. The truth of the matter is that there is no dance in your people. See, Joker can, can let's say it. The truth of the matter is that if you are giving, if you want to be real, if you want to be yourself, you ought not to come to that puppy today. Or you need to come to that people and say, brethren, I am in trouble. Please call on God for me. But you see, it is possible that because of the hazard of our ministry, we can be actor. We can be dramatic. We can be people that are saying things that is not exactly the condition of our heart. Sometimes we say, no, 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 no. Even though I'm having uh, this for, for the sake of the people. So, for example, there may be some things that you are struggling with. But when it is time for officiating, you put on that gown. You put on the castle. You put on the regalia of ministry. 
and then you march in, you march in. Oh, my brother, that is the first thing that has killed the matter of transformation. When the man of God is not real, when the man of God continues to practice drama, when he continues to be an actor, a pretender, an hypocrite, and you know we always think it is right for us to do that, but we think it is correct for us to do that because if, if you want to encourage the member, if you want to make them feel good, if you want them to feel nice, you just have to pretend that you are all right, not knowing that that is the bane of our ministry. The first matter in the ministry that brings effective transformation is the ministry of a genuine, a correct, a transparent life. It is that life that creates transformation. If that life is not there, if that life is not at work, there will be nothing. There will be nothing for people to change with. So Jesus said, First, take the beam out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. I want all of you to see the process of effective transformation now. He said, first, take the beam out of your own eye. So which means the first priority for a ministry that will bring effective ministration is the priority of my own life. The priority of my own personal private work with God. Please permit me to say to you that what matters to you as a man, as a woman of God, is not first your public life. It is your private life your private victory, your private, your private work with God is the first issue that we need to take note if we are going to have a ministry that brings transformation. It says, take the beam out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye then you will see clearly. When I look at the word of God, I say, then you will see clearly. What it means to me is that you will have an effectiveness. You'll be able to discern properly. You'll be able to speak accurately. You'll be able to bring people into their knees because you are pointing at the correct issue. You will see clearly where the speck is. You'll be able to pinpoint it and people will come under conviction because you are seeing clearly. That is the first, first, first matter to focus on. But in the midst of that, the Lord Jesus gave us a second side to this matter. Now, I had to come on this because it precedes preaching. It's much more important than preaching. Who you are is more important than what you are doing. Who you are is more crucial than what you are saying. Being is more important in God's work than doing. And so Jesus, the Bible said, this thing Jesus began to do and then to teach. So before you start teaching, something must be happening in your own life first. Now, but look at verse 43, and that's a very critical passage we're looking at. For there is no good, there's no healthy tree that bears decayed, worthless, stale fruit. Let me take that. There is no good there is no healthy tree that bears decayed, worthless, 
daily fruit. Now, on the other hand, does a decayed, a wordless, sickly tree bear good fruit? Let's quickly understand that. Jesus was saying, no good fruit, no good tree can bear what? Bad fruit. And no man can gather good fruit from a bad tree. So this is the first matter. No one can collect from your life anything different from who you are inside. Each tree is known and identified by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes. No, it's a cluster of graves picked from a bamboo bush. What are we saying here? What you are, the kind of tree you are, is what determines the kind of fruit you will bring out. So this is where the critical matter is now. No good tree can bear worthless or bad fruit. And on the other hand, no bad fruit, no bad tree can produce good fruit. Every tree must produce after its own kind. So what it means that regardless of what I'm saying, it is who I am that I will produce. A prayerless pastor can, even if he preaches prayer, he cannot produce a prayerful congregation. An arrogant man, even if he tries to pretend humility once in a while, cannot produce a humble family. The truth of the matter is that even when you are saying something good, something positive, that is not what people gather from your life. What they gather from your life is your life. If I'm a man who is full of anger, the truth of the matter is that even when I say, I love you, God is good, and all of that, that is not what is going out. What is coming out it's my anger, my angry life. That's what people are collecting. This is why effective transformation among men in our congregation does not precede the kind of man, the kind of woman that you have become. So look at the Bible. He said the upright the honorable, intrinsically good man out of the good treasure that has been stored in his heart produces what is upright, what is honorable, what is intrinsically good. And the evil man out of the evil storehouse brings forth that which is depraved, that which is wicked, that which is intrinsically evil. For out of the abundance, out of the overflow of the heart, his mouth speak. So, brothers and sisters, before I leave that point, which is very critical, to be an effective man who will bring the ministry that will bring uh, transformation, let us pay attention to this matter. It is my life that affects men. It is who I am that people will collect. If it is possible that I will be saying something and it will be helping people different from who I am, if it were possible to do that, can it not that be a problem? But the problem is that as you are breathing out even the word that you are preaching, it is you, it is you, it is your inner man, it is what is intrinsically in you that is coming out. And that's the only thing we can gather. So a, a fornicator, a pastor who is having problem with uh, 
uh, the problem of women. When you go to that church, if you look at it very well, let them be there for two years, you will soon see that all the people that will pass through him in that church, they will have problems with women. They will be womanizers. It's not that he's preaching to them that they should go and be a womanizer. No, he doesn't need to preach it. He only, every time he stands up, every time he says, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, you will think that people are collecting praise the Lord. No, what they are collecting is that, that, that lifestyle, that thing that is inside of you. That's what is coming out. This is why effective ministry that brings genuine transformation is first and foremost the ministry that your life is releasing. It is the release of your life that we give effective ministration to the people that we are talking to. So before I leave this critical point, I want you to follow me much more now to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, there are two uh, passages I would like to refer to in 2 Corinthians because I'm hoping to end with the the upward ministry, the upward ministry of preaching, of teaching, of bringing the word of God, I would like to end with that. But I can't start talking about teaching and preaching and all of that when the issue of life, because it is life that begets life. If it is not life that begets life, oh my God, it would have been easier. It would have been easier. We'll have seen revival with so much uh, meetings that were running everywhere, uh, with so much activities, all the loudspeakers, all the shouting. It will have brought something, but cannot bring anything. No congregation can be more spiritual than his pastor. No student can be greater than his teacher. No disciple can be higher than his master. This is a principle that Jesus had laid, which I pray that God will give you grace to understand. Now, let's go quickly to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going to read 2 Corinthians 2 and 2 Corinthians chapter 4. If we have time, I will have spent time on all of that. But I don't have the time, and I still must get to our Timothy. Now, in 2, Timothy, I mean, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, all of you please come there. Come there, let's come there. In verse, uh, verse 14, verse 14, uh, let's first start reading it from the King James version, maybe the New King James, and then we'll start checking it from other versions that may be of help to us. Then now, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ Jesus. And through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Let me go over that again. Now, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ Jesus. Please know if God is not able to lead us in triumph, if we are not triumphant, if we are not victorious, if we are not living a life on top, on top of the devil, on top of sin, on top of the things that is weighing everybody down in Christ Jesus, then there is nothing God has in his hand to diffuse, to spread abroad the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. So, you know, I thought that the first thing will have been preaching. The first thing will have been to preach. But look at the word of God said, now thanks be to God who always leads us about, leads us in triumph in Christ. And through us, diffuses, diffuses the fragrance 
of his knowledge in, in every place. For we are to God. The fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved. So you can see that the first thing that God is looking for is for you to become a fragrance. A fragrance, an aroma, a sweet savour eh, of Christ among those that have been saved. That the first ministry that will bring transformation is that me, myself, my life, God is leading me about in a triumphant procession. God is taking me up and down and say, can you see what I've done in Brother Gilead's life? Can you see what I've done with this man? This is my beloved son. This is my servant indeed. Can you follow him? He uses us to diffuse the fragrance, the aroma of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who have been saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, we are the aroma of death leading to death. And to the other, the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for this thing? Before I come to verse 17. Verse 17 is going to take me to where I'm going before. But I don't want to go there yet. Can you read that for us from NIV? Can you, if you have NIV, uh, you will read that for us. Please flash it up if it is there so that we can pick it up. Yes. Yes. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ. And through us, spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. Verse 15, please. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who have been saved and those who are perishing. Verse 16. To the one, we are the smell of death. Which means when we come, those that are perishing, the aroma of our life, we, we choke them. We show them what is strong in their life. And that will force them to be transformed. And if they don't want to be transformed, they will run away. So the other, the fragrance of life. Look at the Bible. And who is equal to such a task? That's our task. That's our ministry. That's what God has called us to do. It's a task for me to smell. It's a task for me to be an aroma, a fragrance of Christ in the hand of God that he will use to diffuse his knowledge everywhere, to diffuse his knowledge everywhere so that people who need to know Christ, who need to experience Christ, when they have seen my life and they have smelled what is coming out of my life, they will say yes. This is the kind of life we want. Why is my own life different? Why am I like this? That's what will bring genuine transformation to them. And to those who are adamantly going to hell, they won't go to hell and say, I've never, I've never smelled uh, what is right. They say, yes, the aroma came to me, but it was choking because I did not want the truth. I prefer darkness to light. And that's why they will not have excuse anywhere they go. Now, if you take that scripture and you go to Philip's Modern English, can you check? Do we have Philip Modern English there? Bring verse 14, verse 15 and 16 out, if we have it. Uh, please make it bold so that we can read it together. Philip's Modern English. Now it says, thanks be to God who leads us wherever we are on his own triumphant way and makes our knowledge of him spread throughout the world like a lovely perfume. We Christians have the unmistakable scent of Christ, discernible alike to those who have been saved and to those who are heading for death. 
To the latter, it seems like the very smell of doom. To the former, it has the fresh fragrance of life itself. Who could think himself adequate for a responsibility like this? You see, many of you think that your first responsibility is to officiate. If you will let me talk to you, your first responsibility is to smell, is to bring the aroma of Christ's life. That when you have entered into the church, when you have come into the congregation, you have brought something to them. You have brought an aroma of Christ. And all of them, without thinking twice, they are smelling the fragrance of Christ. The knowledge of Christ becomes sweet to them. And they are eager to be part of it. They are eager to partake of that life. That is transformation. That is the kind of transformation we are looking at. That the sinner, when he met you, say, I, I have seen Jesus. I can't continue like that. And his life changes. And he comes home and says, I, I am different now. I'm born again now. You have a new author now. That is the kind of thing God is looking for. Now, who is, who is equal to this task? Who is equal to this responsibility? Sometimes you may not know that that is our first responsibility if we are going to be agents of transformation. Now, I said you should keep verse 17 because verse 17 will be linking me up with the next thing I want to deal with about the ministry that we bring transformation. Yes. The ministry that we effect transformation in people's lives. Now, look at the next point that I want to read out to you. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We jump chapter 3 because we simply want to move on. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. In verse 1, all of you please. Therefore, since we have this ministry, we have received mercy. As we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. We faint not. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame. Not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth. All of you, please go back to that scripture. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, the things of hypocrisy, nor walking in craftiness. Nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but how? By manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Wow, please follow me. I would think that what the man of God will have said is that we have renounced the hidden things of shame. Things of hypocrisy, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by the proclamation of the truth. I thought that that's what he should have used. Proclamation, the preaching of the truth. No. No. What did he say? But by the manifestation of the truth. What God is looking for is not first a man who can proclaim. God is looking for men and women who by their lives, there is the manifestation of the truth. What do I mean by manifestation? What is the meaning of manifestation? Manifestation is, is a showing forth, a, a coming out. I see what God is looking for in me as a preacher it's not how much I can proclaim, but he wants the truth to be made manifest in my life. He wants that 
if they say, oh, be humble. Instead of me to be preaching, be humble, be humble, be humble. Let humility, the truth of humility, let it be made manifest in my life. If they say, oh, this man is a lovely man. He loves his wife. He loves his children. He loves the brethren. Rather than for me to start proclaiming, love the brethren. Husbands, love your wife. What was God looking for? God is looking for a man in me who by the manifestation of the truth, all of you, please read that scripture again. Say, but by manifestation of the truth, commending, hey, my God, look at the Bible, commending Christ to you. Is that what the Bible said? Please read your Bible. But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. You see, where genuine transformation takes place is when you when your life grips the conscience of the people. When by your life, by the manifestation of the truth, your life, your own self, is being commended to every man's conscience in the sight of God. You know, I've been looking at that all the years. And I found that that is the effective ministry that brings transformation. I have seen people that have been very, very forcefully converted simply because they have seen the manifestation of the truth in our life, even, even before we preach it. I have seen people that came under serious conviction and they were weeping all night. And when you ask them, did you hear a message? They say, no, I saw you. I saw your life. I saw the way you operated. I saw the way you were acting. It has put a difference in my life. How can I misbehave now? My conscience will not let me go. I have seen the truth. I've seen the way to do things. It's koro koro in my eyes. I cannot, I, I cannot go. I see I will not be, my conscience will, will, will make me go free. By the manifestation of the truth. When I saw that this is what God is looking for, when I saw that the Bible said we are the aroma, the aroma of Christ, the fragrance of his knowledge, and that is my responsibility. And I'm here again, I'm seeing the word of God saying, by the manifestation of the truth, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Now look at the Bible. Say, but even if our gospel is veiled, if our gospel is hidden, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose mind the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe. Let the light, oh my God, all of you, I, ho I hope you are following the Bible now. Let's go back again. But if our gospel is veiled. You see the meaning of the word veiled. That is, if our gospel is, is, is covered. I thought that what you would have said that if our gospel is on hard. No. God does not want men to hear the gospel before they see the gospel. God is more interested that they will see the gospel in my life they will see the manifestation of the truth with me. And it is the manifestation they see. It is the manifestation of the truth that they see that will convict their souls, that we that we deal with their conscience, and their lives cannot but be transformed. Say, but even if our gospel is hid, if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Whose mind the God of this age has blinded. 
Oh my God. Whose mind the God of this age has blinded. I was thinking I would have said he blocked their mind from hearing the word of God. But no, it is not the blocking of their ears that is the issue. It is that their mind has been blinded from seeing. When you use the word blind, that means they cannot see. So the word of God says, let the light, the light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, to do what? To shine upon them the light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, to shine upon them. Oh, my brothers, my sisters, I wanted to hear that because these are the key issues that will bring transformation. I know that what you will have thought I should be dealing with will have been power, power, power. Uh, but power is not as powerful as light that is shining. The Bible said, for we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your born servant for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has done what? Who has shown in our hearts to give the light. Oh my God. I thought it would have been to give the knowledge. Mm -mm. To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And verse 7 says, but we have this treasure in the investors that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Hallelujah. So what are we trying to point out here? The light that shines. I said the light that smells, that, that smells the fragrance of the knowledge of Jesus Christ is what God is needing to both bring transformation to those that have been saved and even those that are perishing to bring them under conviction. Is that fragrant? And then here we are seeing again that the light of the glory, the light of the knowledge of the glory of Jesus Christ must be shining in our own heart so that the truth is made manifest to the people. So. When Jesus Christ said, you are the light of the world. I saw that that is our first responsibility. When you read Matthew chapter 4, where the Bible said Jesus departed, you know, into Galilee. Let's read Matthew 4 quickly before we return here. Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, all of you please. And come with me. We read verse 16. Maybe, no, not verse 16, verse 12. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, look at what, when Jesus was moving to leave, you know, and dwell in Capernaum, the Bible said it was to fulfill a prophecy. What is that prophecy? The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have done what? Have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. What is this light that has dawned? What is this great light they saw? They are seeing a light that is light. Jesus was the light. No wonder everywhere Jesus said, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Whosoever follows me will not walk in darkness, 
I pray that me also I'll be able to say boldly, I am the light of this generation. I am the light of my people. Whosoever follows me, even in discipleship, will not walk in darkness because he will have the light of light. He will have the light of light to live. He will have the light to walk with because that light is our light. May the Lord make you the light of your congregation. May the Lord cause your light to shine. So you will see, I've been using some very important word I said, manifestation rather than proclamation. Smelling, smelling, smelling rather than shouting. Then we are coming out shining, shining the light, shining the live light rather than shouting. It was not loudspeaker that will give us transformation, brother. It is not this big, big, big public address system that will bring transformation to our generation. It is this light that is shining. It is this light that is light that when it comes in any place, darkness cannot stay. Darkness immediately is exposed. And that is what God is asking us to do. And that is our ministry. That is the ministry that will bring effective <clears throat> transformation. Now go further back to the second Corinthians chapter four that we're reading. There are still two more issues I would like to raise there. Now look at verse 10, chapter 10, I mean chapter four, verse 10, verse 11 and verse 12. These are very tiny but critical, critical, a critical issues for ministry that will bring transformation. Look at the Bible. He said, always, always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be what? May be manifested in our body, manifestation. So he said, we who are alive, we are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested, manifested in our mortal body, which means the more death is working in us, death to self, death to the world, Death to sin, death to things of, 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 the, of the natural, the more death is working in us, the more life will be working in those that are hearing us. But if I refuse to continue to die, to die to self, to die to this world, to die to fame, to die to position, to die to all of those, and I'm clinging, when I'm clinging, and I'm not letting death walk. There'll be no light that will be passing to the people that are hearing me. They'll be hearing words. They'll be hearing sermons. But light is not reaching them. So the ministry that we bring transformation is that ministry from a man in whom death is at work constantly. A man who is who is able to say, I die daily. And the more death is working in you, the more you will see light breaking forth in those that are hearing you. That is how God has ordained it. That's what God wanted us to be. That's the kind of men, that's the kind of women God is wanting us to become when he says we are his agents of transformation. This evening, and I go a little further now. Now, what is now the instrument that God has put in our mouth, in our hands, for us to be able to discharge this effective ministry that brings transformation? Apart from your life, there must be light. Your life, there must be a fragrance in his hands. Your life, 
that is experiencing death, death to the flesh, regularly, all the time, so that Christ's life is made manifest more and more and more in you and is working in the people that are hearing you. The next thing is the instrumentality of the word of God. The instrumentality of the word of God. Let me say to you, the Bible says, let me quickly read it so that it will be clear because this is the last thing I think I can be able to undo uh, during this meeting, commending you to God. Now, Jesus, when he came, he said, Father, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is good. What will sanctify men from the life of sin? What will set them free from the power of darkness? Is the word of truth. He said you shall know the truth. And what will the truth do? The truth will make you free. The truth will set you free. Now, so whenever God wants to bring transformation to people's lives, Apart from the life of the preacher that must first of all shine, that must first of all smell, that must first of all break forth, the next instrument is the word of God. It's the word of God. And so you see, as we are reading in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, I told you that I won't read it then, but now I can read it. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 17. He said, He said, And who is sufficient for this thing? Who is equal to this task? Who is able to bear this kind of enormous responsibility? Therefore, we are not as so many peddling the word of God. But as of sincerity, but as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. Now, so let me quickly introduce something here. There is something the Bible calls the peddling of the word of God. Peddling the word of God is very, very different from preaching the word of God. Please, can you check other versions for me for that verse 17 so that we can make a little input into what does it mean to peddle the word of God? What does it mean? Can you bring it up from the... Uh, no, no. Okay. We can read Amplified here. That we are not like so many, like Oxstar, Oxstar, making a trade of peddling God's word just changing and adulterating the divine message. So when you are paid, when you pay the word of God, it's as if you are doing a merchandise of it. Can you check good news? Can you help us check whether we can get something from good news? From good news? What did he say? We are not like so many others who handle God's message as if it were Cheap merchandise. But because God has sent us, we speak with sincerity in his presence as servants of Christ. We do not peddle God's message. We do not handle God's word as if it were a cheap merchandise. You are not on the pulpit to sell. You are not on the pulpit to be doing as if you are buying and selling. God has put his word in our mouth because the only, it's only the word of God that changes the heart of men. It's only the word of God that turns people's lives around. You want to read the message for us? Bring it out from message. I thought I was going to read it in Yoruba language now. Yes? No, but at least we don't take God's word, water it down, 
and then take it to the street to sell it cheap. We don't water the word of God down. We don't make a jest of the truth of the word of God. Because you are a custodian of the mysteries, actually you are the steward of the mysteries of God. You are the oracle, you are the one carrying the oracles of God. You don't treat it as if you are joking. You don't preach it as if you are peddling it. You don't water it down. If you don't understand what the word of God is saying, bow your knees and pray until God will come to you on it. You don't go and just be speaking anyhow as if you just want to entertain the people. He said, we don't take the word of God to the street to sell it cheap. We stand in God, in Christ's presence. When we speak, every time we speak, we have a sense that we are standing in the presence of God. God looks us in the face. We get what we say straight from God and say it as honestly as we can. May God make you an effective minister. Let me read it in Yoruba language. Onitanyo asi tofun kanwayi. Nitori awa kudabi anwa okolopo. Tin fi oro lorun so wo jenwo. Subwani nu o tito. Lati nu o tito inu wa. Ni awa an soro ni wadi o lorun. Ni no kristi kekebi anwa ti aran. Pati o do lorun wa. Awa kudabi anwa okolopo. Tin fi oro lorun so wo jenwo. And I see many people set up churches. They said, and I think it's uh, Isaiah that was saying yesterday. I said, yeah, the people say, where I walk, there I chop. So it's like, walk, chop, walk, chop, walk, chop. I see God's church has become your, your little farm where you are, you are chopping. No. If you are going to be a minister that will bring transformation to people, you must not be one who peddles the word of God, who just look for one Bible verse in order to raise some offering. You are not just looking for something that will make people to be excited. Then you now say, put your hand in your pocket now and just close your eyes, dip it down, dip it down. I say, dip it down, dip it down. Bring something good, bring something good, 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 good. And, and you have become. You have become, no, 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 God, God, God will not allow us to do that. God is calling us to a serious work to bring transformation to people's lives. Now, so let's now go back to our passage in Second Timothy chapter 2. For well, that's where we need to end. And I think the time we have left is very, very little. So I will just deal with that quickly and I will be commending you to God. I'll be trusting God that this MRR will bring a turning point in your own ministry by the grace of God and that we are going to hear good news about you. We are going to see churches under your hand come into great experience of revival in the name of Jesus Christ. You're coming out here we never be in vain. So look at it. They say, they say, be diligent to present yourself approved to God. A worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and being by idle babbling, but they will increase to more ungodliness. And their message will spread like cancer. Immenials and philatists are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. Now, go with us back to the Amplified Version that we were reading in the morning, and let's pick it up from verse 15. He said, study and be eager and do your utmost to present yourself to God approved, tested by trial. But we have dealt with that in the morning where we now want a workman, a workman who has no cause to be ashamed. My brother, to be an effective, to
to bring effective ministry that will bring transformation. You can't be a lazy man. God calls him a workman. And do you know Jesus said, oh, the harvest is plenty. Let's pray. The Lord of harvest, that he will send who? Laborer. Let me tell you the truth. The truth is that if you are going to really, really serve God to bring transformation, a laborer, like God or there, you must be a laborer. A laborer. Then let's pray the Lord of us to send laborer, not eater, not director, not those who love to sit in the in the on the on the pulpit just to just to just to take all the glory. We are looking for laborers, laborers who will soil their hands. Laborers who will bend down to labor until people's lives are transformed and changed. And if you are looking for genuine revival, genuine revival will bring us into critical labor. Every time I see Jesus calling men to his work, he said, I'm sending you to their labor. It's a labor. So sometimes when you hear us say revival labor, revival labor, we wanted to be clear to our heart. That we are laborers. We are laborers. I know it is more prestigious to say, well, we are ministers. We are ministers of God because you did not understand the meaning of the word minister. The word minister actually is a slave, a slave, a servant, and a slave of God. That's the word minister. When they, when they said Elijah, I mean Elisha, uh, bond is the uh, oxen and all of that, and if he, he, he became a minister to uh, Elijah, pouring water in his hand. Look, that's a business like you. That's what he became in order to serve God. Are you here? Are you a laborer, or you are just a eater? Are you just looking for something to eat? Are you just looking for something popular? Are you in the ministry just to find a good means of living? Or you are here to labor? He said, a workman, a workman, a workman. Jesus said, look, a laborer is worthy of his means. Laborer. Laborers in the vineyard. Now, so the first thing I wanted to know is that effective Ministry that will bring transformation only comes from laborers. When you see works that God has blessed, when you see where God has blessed his work, go and look at the lives of those men that God used. You will know that they are not lazy at all. You will know that they are not joking at all. You know that they are laborers. They are laborers. If God is going to increase our ministry, if God is going to enlarge each one of you from where you are coming from by the grace of God, you will enter into his labor. A workman, a workman, who does not need to be ashamed, who have no cause to be ashamed. But now, what does this workman do? Correctly analyzing. All of you, please follow me here. Correctly analyzing and accurately dividing, rightly handling, and skillfully teaching the word of truth. I want to go over that again. So leave that on the screen. He said, correctly analyzing. Many, many times I've listened to many sermons that have modeled up the truth. And if the trumpet does not stand clearly, who will prepare for war? We are not seeing genuine conversion. We are not seeing serious conviction. 
that will make people to weep from their sin. Because the message we are bringing is modeled up. We are not correctly analyzing the truth. We are not bringing the word of God as the sharp sword. He said, my word is like a double-edged sword, piercing, piercing, piercing to the, to, to the joining together of soul and spirit and to the piercing of the bones and marrow. When the word of God is no more sharp in our own mouth, how can he penetrate the hearts of those that are hearing us? Correctly analyzing. Sometimes God will give you a message. Instead of sitting down to preach it, I see you just read the Bible verse, and then you start telling stories, stories of how, how, how uh, elephant and the tortoise were fighting, and they were going somewhere. And you know, people will laugh and laugh and laugh. You don't know that empty stories don't change life. Empty stories cannot, there's no seed in that, in that story. The seed of the kingdom is the word of God. If we don't preach the word of God as it is, there is nothing that can bring transformation to people's lives. Sometimes you may even be a very wonderful speaker. You are speaking many things. You are speaking many things. You are criticizing this, criticizing this. But you have not preached the word of God. You have not preached Christ. You have not preached Christ and him crucified. There is no seed. There is no seed that can dominate and bring transformation. What I'm saying to you is this. If a farmer goes and plow and plow and plow, to Koebe, and he, he brought so many heaps. And when he is now trying to plant, he omitted two rows, thinking that maybe I planted, but he, he, he didn't plant. He goes other way, he was twisted in other places, but this one. Now, when other places are germinating and bringing fruit out, what will happen to those two lines that he omitted? There will be nothing there. It will only grow wheat. Brothers, I want to ask you, are you sowing the seed, the seed of the word of God? Correctly analyzing, correctly analyzing the word and accurately, you see the word, accurately to the labor of a man of God that will bring transformation he must be an accurate divider of the word of God. Accurately dividing. Not modding it up. Separating the chaff from the wheat. Sometimes you carry the Bible, you are only interested about all the other stories around. But what the word of God is saying, you have not brought it out. And yet that is the only seed that will change people. That's the only seed that will correct their lives. That's the only seed that will transform them. That is what changed our own life. That is what keeps us subdued. It is the word of God that pierces our heart. If the word of God that pierces the heart of men is not going out of your mouth on the pulpit, how do you expect men to be changed? It is not laughter that will change the people. It is not the shaking of their head that will change the people. It is the seed. The seed is the word of God. It must be man for really analyzing and accurately dividing. Now look at the next word. Rightly handling. Rightly handling. So look at three words I'm dealing with now. Correctly analyzing, accurately dividing the truth, rightly handling. There's a way in which we handle the word of God that will bring conviction to soul, that will bring conversion to soul, that will bring conformity in their lives to Christ Jesus. And skillfully, skillfully teaching the word of truth. This fourth dimension is so critical, but I don't have the time tonight 
to have settled into it and say, okay, let's train ourselves on how do we correctly analyze the word of God? How do we accurately divide the word of truth? How do we rightly, rightly handle the word of life? And how do we skillfully teach it? The Bible spoke about, about Ezra, who was a scribe, a religious scribe, that he sat down. He prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord. Sitting down to search the word of God. To get into the word of God until the word of God has got into you. As a man who wants to handle the word of life, the need for you to sit down and analyze the truth until the truth itself has become very clear to you that it can be made manifest in your life because it is now your own life. And then correctly, correctly, accurately dividing the truth. Don't lump it up. Sometimes when you are preaching, you take one passage from Genesis, and before you finish, you have already dashed the Sons of Solomon, and from Sons of Solomon, you are back in the, in the, in the book of Ecclesiastes, and then you go and end up with one big story somewhere, and everybody is confused. They're saying, what is this man saying today now? And when you think that the people are boring, you say, shout hallelujah, stand back. What's the meaning of that? Eh? You're saying something serious. You're also cracking joke. We will stop on this. The ministry that will bring effective transformation must be the ministry part of your life. It must be the ministry that your own life is carrying. And it must be priority. Your own correctness, your own standing with God is first, first, first a priority. Even if you don't get to preach, people's life will change because they will collect that life from you. It will break forth upon them. It will reach to them. You must be a man that God is leading about in his triumphant procession. You cannot be a defeated man in the triumphant procession of Jesus. You cannot be, you know, in and out, up and down, and God will use you as an aroma. No! You will bring disgrace to his name. And then I said, death is at work in you. Death to self. Whenever I see you unnecessarily beating your chest, I say, what is the meaning of this now? When will this brother die to the old man? When will he die to Mr. Fletch? When our brother was talking to us uh, at the uh, opening welcome uh, message, he said, yes, yeah, some of us have been going through the concept of discipleship, and I thank God for that. But that concept ought to have brought you to the place of death so that Christ's life may be oozing out. This will be the power of your ministry. It is the life of Christ in you that will be the hope of the glory that we are talking about. You must be a laborer. A laborer. A workman that has no reason to be ashamed. You must carry within you the light, light, the light. When the light shines, darkness cannot comprehend it. My prayer is that the Holy Ghost who has brought us so far, he will lay his hands upon you. The power of the Holy Spirit will come upon you afresh. And I'm trusting God that before you finish the meeting, if you have not been filled with the Holy Spirit, please don't go. God is intending to open the heavens again and pour his anointing upon your head. 
Our brothers along there with you, they will help us to pray. They will lay hands on those that are yet to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And God will honor his promise. God will honor his word in the name of Jesus Christ. And then the last thing I said, the weapon of our ministry is the word of God. The sword of the spirit is what God uses to pierce the heart of men. It was as they heard Peter preach on the day of Pentecost. that when they heard this word, it's the word of God that they had that pierced their heart. They say their heart was pierced. And they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? When last did you preach and you were interrupted with men who cried out? God wants to do that again. God wants to visit me and you again. Rightly. Rightly deep handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. But, verse 16, avoid all empty, vain, useless, idle talk. My brother, your mouth, your lips must keep knowledge. The Bible says the lips of the priest must keep and retain knowledge. No vain, useless, I do empty talk. You know what it does? It will lead people into more and more ungodliness. If the word that come out of your mouth is the empty, vain, useless, I do talk. It doesn't increase righteousness. It only leads people more and more onto ungodliness. And such kind of teaching normally spread very fast. Say it devour, and it will eat its way like cancer and spread like gangrene. That is how Himenos and Philetus were peddling their own error and they have overthrown the faith of many. They have missed the mark. They are swerved from the truth. They enter into empty philosophy. And sometimes some of you, because you have gone for a school of theology or something, you have started to embrace ordinary philosophy of human beings. And you are no longer giving attention to scripture. You don't tremble at the word of God again. You rather trample on it. How do you expect transformation? When you are not diligent in, in teaching and preaching, the undiluted word of God. How will you expect transformation? When we gather in church for two, three hours, you will dance, you greet people, you do everything else. When everybody is tired and exhausted and hungry and they're about to go, you say, yes, isn't God good? Let's find something just to say before you go. We know already you know the Bible. We know you know the Bible. Then you just look for something like a, like a cracker. Just look for one small biscuit like that. And then you throw it to the people. And in 15 minutes, you are finished. And what did you say? Nothing. Nothing. You only motivated them so that they can come again. I hear you. I see you preaching miracles. I didn't see Jesus do that. Jesus did miracles. He didn't preach it. He said, these signs will follow you. Preach the word. It's the word of God that they preach that brought miracles. And I beg you to please go out of this meeting preaching the word. Eh? Be instant in season and out of season. Rebuke. Be very diligent. Let's read that chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. I charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, Wow, time, time has gone. Who is to judge the living and the dead and by in the light of his coming and his kingdom? Herod and preach the word. My dear brother, Herod and preach the word. I'm taking it from the Amplified. Keep your sense of urgency. Keep your sense of urgency. Don't be sluggish. Don't be slow. Stand by and be at hand and ready. 
whether the opportunity seems to be favorable or unfavorable, whether it is convenient or inconvenient, whether it is welcome or unwelcome, as the preacher of the word of God, you are to show people in what way their lives are wrong. Don't be a man pleaser. Go and preach the word of God. And if you are teaching and preaching the word of God, men will come under conviction. You will see conversion. You will see genuine transformation in the coming days. You will see people turn over to God very violently because the word of God has come upon them. And you convince them, rebuking and correcting, warning and urging and encouraging them, being unflagging and inexhaustible in patience and teaching. Inexhaustible in patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not tolerate or endure sound and wholesome instruction. For having ears teaching for something pleasing and gratifying, they want to hear what they like to hear. They will gather to themselves one teacher after another to a considerable number. Old King James said they will heap unto themselves teachers. And so you can see so many people everywhere now seeming to preach. You go on one street, you go into a primary school, you just see all kinds of people, everybody singing, shouting, and all of that. And what are they saying? They're saying what people only want to hear. Can I put it to you? Don't be a soothsayer. Who is a soothsayer? A soothsayer is a man who says what suits people. Don't be a man who is only a matetini. Eh, mama, maka mani mwaleti. Eh, pierce their ear. Pierce their ear, circumcise their heart. Let the sword of the spirit come out. And God will confirm his word in your life in the name of Jesus Christ. He said, they will have been having ears itching for something pleasing and gratifying. They've gathered to themselves one teacher after another to a considerable number, chosen to satisfy their own liking and to foster the errors they hold. And they will turn aside from hearing the truth and wander off into myth and man-made fiction. This is what we have seen now. As you, for you, become and cool and steady, accept and suffer suffer and fleetingly every action, do the work of an evangelist and fully perform all the duties of your ministry. The Lord Almighty will bless you and he will perfect what concerns you. I will ask us to pray together as I, I know we are working behind time, but God will help us. I know your family clinic is waiting. Can we please pray together? Let's pray together. Please rise up with me as we pray. I just want you to make a commitment to God and say, Lord, Lord, you have called me into this ministry. You have put the word of life in my mouth. But the first, the first critical ministry is the ministry of my life. Your life must be ministering to people. Your life is the life that men must collect. Please pray and say, Lord, make my life, make my life whole again. Make my life a blessing. Make my life the kind, oh God, that will be an aroma to you. Make my life your life. That we manifest the truth. That we shine forth your glory. Let my life not be blown again. Please help my life. Let's pray. Let's pray. Just want you to call on God before we continue. Just want you to say, Lord, let my ministry, let it ooze out of my life. Let my words no longer be an idle talk in the ears of people. Let my word backed up with life. Let it become a hammer that breaks the heart of men. He said, we commend ourselves by the manifestation of the truth to the conscience of every man. 
what a very powerful ministry. A lie that affects people's conscience without talking. Their conscience is already, you know, shaking because they have seen truth being manifested. Please pray. Lord, turn us around, oh God. Make us ministers that will bring transformation to our generation. And Lord, let this meeting mark the beginning of a great and new thing you want to do in our lives. Lord, thank you for answering this prayer. Thank you for your servants, our brothers and sisters that have been here since yesterday, and they are carried in your presence. I ask, Lord, that you will turn your eyes upon us. And the life that, that affects men, the life that will create transformation in other people's lives, is the life you are saying we should carry from here. Lord, I ask that you quicken that life in your people. I ask, oh God, that as we have been crying to you, as we have been responding to you, as we have been coming to the altar and saying, Lord, you must approve me. I want you, oh God, to breathe upon this brother. Breathe upon this lady. Breathe upon this, your servant. And let something new, something great, something glorious break forth by their life in the name of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, please undertake for us. And I ask, that as they will write, let your word be fire in their mouth. Let your word become like, like hammer in their hand. Let your word become the double-edged sword on their lips, piercing the heart of men and bringing men on their knees. Lord, I want to trust you that by their lives and by their instrumentality, there shall be transformation. There shall be revival. There shall be an increase. Lord, all the ministry they represent, Either they are pastors over a local church, or they are evangelists, or they are doing any other aspect of ministry. Lord, I pray that there will be a divine visitation. There will be something new that will break forth out of their ministry. And we will rejoice, oh God, that this minister that you are raising again, they are your agents to bring transformation to, to our land, to our denominations, and to the country of Nigeria and beyond. Thank you for hearing our prayer. As we go on from this meeting, please undertake for your people because your face will stand upon them particularly. In Jesus Christ's name, we have prayed. Amen.